everyone. Welcome, good morning. Thank you for joining. Seven billion people should be at this class today. It's information for everybody in the world to know. And it will lift the spirits of every human being alive if they would listen to this class. And as a Hashem, seven billion people will listen to this class because very soon this information is going to be obvious for the entire world. The mic is on. Yeah. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, I haven't developed it enough, but the idea is just phenomenal. Okay. The, first of all, I want to thank, this is supposed to be the last class in the series called What Now? But Baruch Hashem, we had some extensive research on some of the some of the subjects, and we turned two of the classes into double. The last class we turned into double was the one dealing with um, the big ideas, and that was we ended up with a class A and a class B. And now the next class, which is first fruits, we had class A last week, and we're going to do class B today second part. Um, I want to thank the Werdiger family for their contribution for this class. Now, the idea of first fruits, as I mentioned, the, the, um, what, what are the signs of changing times? And that we're living, Moshiach is a reality. So last week, in last week's class, I spoke of what I would call in Yanim Pnimiyim. I spoke about eternal changes that are taking place within the soul of creation, primarily the experience of Jewish people in their Judaism as Jews, and how that has taken a dramatic change in terms of knowledge of God, in terms of having prophecy, in terms of having advisors who we can go to that can give us heavenly advice and everything, um, in terms of joyful service that we spoke about, bringing back the laughter into Judaism, and the joy and the happiness, and so on and so forth. We spoke about the various different things. The attitudes towards the dark days of exile and, 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 and gullus and the way we experience our, our, our sad days. We don't see any more the sadness in them, but we see already the potential yomtiv in them. And we're saying how this is all across the board, how Jews are kind of moving away from the doom and gloom kind of Judaism, and people are moving to a whole new optimistic approach, which is Hasidism, which is Mashiach. And that's what we had discussed in the earlier class. These are signs of Mashiach. Um, primarily the most important thing is the knowledge of Hashem that is now available for every person that wants to study and learn in every language. And we spoke that even the Tanya, such a monumental book, is available for even for blind people. That's how accessible it is. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about global... Today we're going to talk about global changes. And we're going to take a look and see is the world as bad as the media makes it sound, or is the world actually a Gan Eden? And you'll be surprised to find out that we're living in a Gan Eden the world. We're living in a world that only Judaism could predict a few thousand years ago that that will be. Doesn't mean that there's no problems yet that need to be fixed, but um, it's ridiculous that the news we're being fed all day long is focusing on those tiny little sore infections that there are, when you're looking at an entire world that is unbelievably healthy, unbelievably strong, and unbelievably happy. Um, so we're going to get to that in a moment. But let's first talk about, we we'll continue about the Jewish people, because we always remember that Israel, the Jewish people, are the nucleus of creation, we're the soul of the world. So now let's talk, the next stage of my discussion in this class is going to be the relationship of Jew versus non-Jew. Till now we spoke about the inner world of the Jewish experience. Now we're going to talk about the relationship of Jew versus non-Jew. In this period of time, when Jews were given the task for rectifying, to help the world reach its potential, to help humanity reach its potential, the Eberster God, we just came from Pasha's Yisroi, chose us at Har Sinai, gave us a mission, a chosen people, a chosen people not to be chosen and get a lot of perks and, you know, have a lot of pina colada or something like that whenever we want. That's not what it means to be chosen because that's not what happened throughout history. We weren't living like, royal, like royalty. We, we suffered probably more than any other people in the world for being the chosen people. We, we were chosen for the task of elevating humanity, to be the leaders and to bring all of humanity into the enlightened age of Moshiach. 
So for thousands of years, you know, we did it while the very people we were helping were persecuting us and oppressing us. That's like crazy. We were here to help humanity, and at, while we were doing that, we were being persecuted in the most horrific way. And we had to do our tikkunim, our tikkun, which we do for the world as a result of Torah and mitzvahs. Because basically what we're really doing with all of our mitzvahs is that we're removing the blockages. That's the idea of mitzvahs. We re remove the block that blocks the divine from expressing itself, and we help facilitate God within creation. And once God fills the universe and fills creation in a visible, open manner, then it brings infinite blessing, unity, harmony, synchronizes all of existence, and you end up with a perfect world like we're seeing today. But we're going to get to that in a moment. But while we were doing that work, we were being persecuted, and we had every obstacle that was getting in our way, not allowing us to do that work. So we had our hands tied behind our back. We were almost completely blindfolded. We hardly can move. And in that par paralyzed, so almost paralyzed state, we had to do this task. And meaning there were nation after nation that did not allow Jew, uh, the Jewish people to live in freedom. We lived amongst the nations. We had a very hard time persecuted in regarding our religious matters. In Spain, for instance, we had so, all the Jews living in, in Spain, but then they either they had to leave the country, or if they stayed, they couldn't practice their Judaism. And if they do, they had to do it in unbelievable secrecy, at the risk of their lives. And if you talk about the Crusaders before that, massacred hundreds of communities, forcing people to accept Christianity. And this is, we have a lot of data from the European countries. We don't even have so much data from the, from the, from the Arab countries and the Muslim countries, what kind of persecutions we've been through. Throughout our entire history, we were, we were brutalized for being Jewish. And, the, and our Gentile hosts, in most cases, were very hostile. And we had periods of peace and tranquility, but they were very short-lived. And most of the times, it did come, even during the times of peace, there was still lots of restrictions and extra taxes. We paid a heavy price for being Jewish all along history. All of that started changing in the mid-1900s. After we came to America, Tremendous change happened. The beginning when Jews came to America, they still had to adapt to living a non-Jewish life to be successful in America, or at least they thought so. Which means, in, in practical thing, if you wanted to hold a job, and you know, America was the, was the land of opportunity for equal, so you weren't gonna be discriminated of being a Jew, at least from the government's uh, perspective, but there was a lot of anti-Semitism still, as I mentioned last time, there were still lots of places that says no Jews and blacks allowed, even here in Hancock Park. So that's the way it was throughout our history. When it comes to the 1950s, 1940s, Jews come to America already in the late 1800s, beginning in 1900s. Most of them feel that they have to drop their Judaism in order to be successful and able to make a living to put bread for their families and build their wealth. And sadly, that was the common understanding. But as more Jews came to the United States, things started changing. And, we, and this was important to, to appreciate that this has not just to do with the masses coming, it has a lot to do with the idea that the world is purifying itself and coming to a state of, 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 uh, of the klipa, the unholiness is dissolving. And the more it dissolves, the less of an obstacle there is against uh, observance of Torah and mitzvahs and so forth. So what happens is a golden age of prosperity suddenly explodes for the Jewish people in America. We, we literally soar up to the very, very heights of prosperity. Jews become generally very wealthy, very well off, and they're able to build Torah institutions, they're able to build and construct, and so on and so forth, and it doesn't come at the cost of our religious observance, other, sadly, than the deep assimilation that started already earlier. But if a Jew that wants to keep his Yiddishkeit did not have to drop his Judaism in order to be a Yid, a Jew can live openly as a Yid, keep Torah and mitzvahs, observe Shabbos, and not only not be rejected or scorned at, actually gaining the respect of the masses for a Jew who's keeping his observances. That happened through the 19, from the 1940s, 50s, 60s. You have Jews, religious, observant, keeping, and very obvious, openly observant, with beard, many Hasidim with payas, and they're in every industry, and they're not bothered. I mean, of course, you'll have an anti-Semite here and there, a slur or something like that, but people as a whole, there's no oppression to what we had before. And as we're gonna see, even in addition to that, there is tremendous 
um, assistance from the government and from governments across the world for the Jewish people in their institutions to practice their Judaism and so on and so forth, and especially to the land of Israel, which <clears throat> at the same time took up a tremendous explosion of development and growth. So first of all, let's see where this says this in the Torah. The Rambam says in, 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 that this is Mashiach. Well, Rambam says in the last parak of Hilchis Malachim, Amru Chachamim, in, in the second halacha, Amru Chachamim, the sages tell us, there is the main primary difference between our world and the world of Mashiach. Rambam says the main thing is the subjugation of the Jewish people to the nations. That we have a foreign authority that rules our lives and governs our lives and gets into, and gets into our connection with our Creator. They interfere with our Judaism. I told you last week that we lost prophecy. In last class I discussed prophecy. We lost prophecy. Rambam in his Mora Nebuchim says the reason we lost prophecy is because we became very sad and depressed. And the Rambam says how can someone be happy when you have you're your, your, your a slave, you're subjugated to foreign powers that are so that are so at that time so undeveloped, so primitive. That's what Rambam is saying. They're primitive people and yet they're oppressing the, the, the rabbis, the great thinkers, the great, how can one live in, in joy and in happiness? So all that oppression, so the Ramam says that, 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 that what's Moshiach? Moshiach is when that Shibut Malchi, a subjugation to the nations comes to an end. So from the 1950s, freedom comes to the Jewish people in a very big way, but it increases, it, it, and, it, and from the United States, it crosses into you know, Canada, and in, in Europe, and Europe and Australia, and all all places across the world, you see a tremendous, tremendous improvement in freedom, in general human rights, but for the Jewish people, tremendous both prosperity, um, and we don't have an interference from the Gentile population in our observance. So it was, but there was one place was still living in the Dark Ages, and we had a third of probably of the Jewish population stuck till the 1990s. Till 1990, a third of the Jewish population is tr stuck under the tyrant rule of the Soviet Union. It's not a democracy. It's a cruel government that is putting all of its efforts into stifle observance. Jewish people led by the Chabad movement, led by the Rebbe, beginning with the previous Rebbe, are having an underground battle and keeping Yiddishkeit alive, but all in tremendous secrecy, under the risk of, God forbid, you know, labor camp, losing their lives, never to be heard of again, and so on and so forth. But they continue the battle. 1990, as I told you earlier, this, the moment we reach midday of Friday, that's midday of Friday, 1990, Tavshin Nun, 5750, suddenly the greatest revolution in human history takes place, the entire Soviet Union, one of the most powerful, probably the second most powerful country in the world, collapses. Its government, its system totally collapses without one person, without a bullet being fired. It's amazing. It doesn't have any precedent in history that such a massive thing should be overthrown and transformed. And as a, as a result of that, democracy explodes across all those countries that were under the Soviet regime. As a result of that, at least three billion people, I'm sorry, three million Jews, or maybe even more than three million Jews, are given two things. First of all, permission to exit their country. They were literally trapped as prisoners in that country. Now they're given free exit, they can leave. They can go up to Eretz Yisrael. The Lubavitcher Rebbe says that the reason they left at that time was because this is the beginning of the prophecy of the Kibbeitz Nitche Yisrael, the Jewish people will be gathered. So in, in one year, it's how the Rebbe progresses. You see, in the year, I think in 1990, the Rebbe says it's not yet kibbutz galiyos, it's not yet the actual gathering of the exiles, but it's a hachana, it's a preparation for kibbutz galiyos. The next year, in the Rebbe's talk, I think in 1991, I, I, I can give you later if you ask me the actual change, the next year the Rebbe says this is the beginning of kibbutz galiyos. And the Rebbe says that even though many of those Jews coming out of Russia did not immediately go to Israel, many of them came over here to the States, many of them went to the different countries and different places, and Australia many, and so on and so forth, the Rebbe says, but that's a temporary thing. Eventually they too will continue on to Israel. 
So the content, the content of this, of this migration, so to speak, is kibbutz Goliath. There's another fulfillment of a prophecy. Jews are given the ability to go to Eretz Israel. And by the way, within the last three, four years, the majority of Jews live in Israel. That changed from all of, our, all of our history. The majority of Jewish people today are in Israel over the United States. I'm not sure the majority of the Jewish people in Israel are co corresponding to the entire diaspora, but definitely overtaking one individual country. There are more Yidden in Eretz Yisrael than there are in the United States. So this is an amazing thing in terms of Jews returning to the land of Israel and so on and so forth. But it's more than that. It's the fact that these Jews were given freedom that they can practice their Judaism without anybody telling them how to live. And, now, and, and if you take a look in, in, in Russia, take a tour, go down there, if you, and go from, from city to city. You'll see thriving schools of hundreds of children on the Chabad and on their other organizations that are learning Torah and saying Shema Yisrael and identifying, recognizing God after 70 years when they tried to completely stifle it. And they thought they were gonna be, they're gonna win, and yet there's no more Soviet regime, there's no more communism, at least in Russia, and what you have is an unbelievable explosion of Jews returning Bali Tshuva, Jews returning to, to Judaism, Jews wanting at least some connection to tradition and so on and so forth. Unbelievable. So this is nothing less than miraculous. In a sense, we can say that today's days, the main thing that Moshiach needed to accomplish, and that is Shibud Malchias. Now you're talking about a nation that for 1900 years was oppressed. For 1900 years, the oppression continued in various different levels at different stages different degrees, different aspects, and that is gone. And Jews are relatively living in prosperity and in, 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 in thriving. Now, of course, we still have the problem with many, many Jews being uninformed and not being exposed to Torah and mitzvahs here in America and so on and so forth. Well, that's our job, <clears throat> to reach out and to help these youth get closer. But we don't have any more an obstacle from the outside. Now, it's an internal struggle that we need to we need to improve and do the work and we see the work is being done across the world okay so that's the idea we spoke about that's the concept of shibud malthius i mean the most important thing is in terms of crushing the exile and the exile being wiped away and geula coming the most important thing has already transpired next there is and in addition to that the Rebbe says an interesting thing. In 1990, 1991, the Rebbe points, he says that this is already the end of exile. You're seeing the idea of a Yechi Yaakov Eretz Mitzrayim, that Yaakov, the Jewish people, live in prosperity. So he says an interesting thing. He says that not only are we living peacefully, but that the nations are assisting the Jewish people to live that way. So it's not that they permit, it's not only your mind your own business, but they're actually helping. So take a look at the amazing thing. Here's, an, here's, a, here's a prophecy where it says in the Navi, it says nations will be your I'll tell you where the Pasuk is. Pasuk Vahayam Malachim Umnayach. Okay. Nineteen. Mem Teshav Gimel. Okay, here we are. So the Pasuk says that the nations will be Umnayach. They will be your, they will raise your children. The, the and their, and their, and their um, noble women, Maniki Sayach, will be your wet nurses. They will, right? So it speaks about the nations recognizing the greatness of the Jewish people. Israel is a tiny little country that um, has had the unbelievable good fortune of having incredible amount of investment being invested in Israel. You have people, Gentiles today in the United States that are sending billions and billions of dollars of private money, I'm not even talking about what the government gives, to help develop Israel. Why do they want to develop Israel? Because they believe the Jewish people are the chosen nation and Israel has to prosper. Now. I know, of course, there is an end story that they that believe in, but it's also messianic. Now they have to appreciate something. So they believe that by Jews and the temple being rebuilt, so this will bring back who they believe is the Messiah. Well, that's something that obviously is not true, but that's okay. Because Rambam says that the entire 
existence of Christianity and the entire existence of Islam is to bring the world to the awareness of one God and the awareness of messianic time. So the fact that they're very strongly believing in Moshiach coming soon and you know, we realize throughout history we were blamed for killing Chas Vashal and the Messiah in there, and we were, uh, we were persecuted for that. Now those very nations and those very descendants of those very people are giving billions of dollars to help Israel prosper and Jewish people prosper. Uh, I'm sure everybody over here has had the experience where you travel somewhere and you meet people and they get just, they light up when they see you and they want to talk to you and they want to tell you they were in Israel and we were there and, and, and they feel like an honor to speak to a Jewish man and a Jewish woman. Let alone the United States of America that has literally been the, such an amazing power of assistance to Eretz Yisrael build and so on and so forth. This is literally what it says over here. In addition to that, how much has the government helped people in, the, in America itself, the Jewish institutions, education, is, and so on and so forth, in which we be, we've received so much government assistance. Again, this is instead of thousands of years, governments oppressing the Jewish people, they turn around and they help the Jewish people. This is the fulfillment of this Navua, in which we see over here, and obviously it's going to increase and increase and increase and ever grow stronger. Now, the other thing that is discussed, Rambam says regarding Mashiach's job, so in chapter 11 of Hilchus Malachim, Rambam says uh, that Mashiach, one of the things he's going to do, Mashiach has to fix the world. Mashiach has to correct the world. Correct the world means to bring peace and harmony amongst nations. And Rambam says in the next one over here, that this that it says, um, that in Yeshaya, that Vigar Zevim Keves, that a wolf will lie with a with a lamb. Venomerim Gedi Yerb will live with a lamb. Venomerim Gedi Yerbats and a leopard with a with a with a young kid will will pasture together. So the Ramam says, Inyan Adavar, what does this mean? It means that the Jewish people will live together with the nations. But in the nations themselves, there will be um, there will be peace and tranquility. They won't harm us, that's what we spoke earlier, but even amongst them. A time of peace and a time of tranquility. Ramam says that in the days of Mashiach there won't be any famine, there won't be any war, there won't be any envy and, and competition because there will be so much abundant good in the world and so much and all the delicacies will be available like dust. Um, so here's just a few interesting things. Um, we're going to soon speak statistics about what the world looked like 100, 200, 300, 400 years ago, basically for all of its history. You're going to be so surprised how violent the world was. And how many people, what were your chances of an, any individual to expect to be killed by human violence across the entire world? And we're talking about for the entire history that we know of man. I want to read, read for you some statistics to see where that, the unbelievable, un incredible decline that is just happened in the shortest period of time to the point that that is very close to being wiped out completely. But let me first, before that, say uh, I'd like to connect everything to what the Torah source says. So remember we were talking so much about how the Rebbe said in 1990, Higiyaz the time of your redemption has arrived. The Rebbe then is the first one and the only one who is giving us this positive way of thinking. That's what, so, that's what we have to appreciate. The, where do we get this way of looking? Because if you generally go speak to people, rabbis, and so on and so forth, lots of people still are carrying a very, a very dark way of, of, of looking at things, that the whole world is bad and evil and horrible and, and the world is only getting darker. And that is a terrible, terrible thing. So we, Hasidim, or whoever is listening, but I'm saying, we were given the task to actually bring the Basura Sagiyula to the world, and what that means is to literally shift people's um, understanding and to see that that's literally false. That's a false narration, it's not true, it's lies. It's what we call today's days fake news. The real story is completely different, but the Rebbe then pointed to us and he said that the institution of the United Nations, which was instituted in 1950. Now again, we today's days have a bad, very bad taste about the United Nations. 
because the United Nations has ganged up on Israel all along. But if I want to take you back to something I said at the beginning of the class. I said at the beginning of the class that the Jewish people were living amongst the nations and doing certain tikkunim amongst the nations. While we were doing that tikkun, that correction, we were one sheep among 70 wolves. We were fixing the wolves while they kept on biting at us. Okay, hear that. We were fixing the wolves while they kept on biting us. Now we didn't have to go there. We could have stayed in Israel and kept away from them, but we needed to fix the wolves. So we went, we went amongst the 70 wolves so they can, we can fix them and we changed them as we're soon gonna see how much we changed the, 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 the world. Now, the final rectification takes place in that hall called the UN. And we have the wolves getting extremely upset and really biting at the sheep. But at the same time, the sheep is completely transforming them. That organization of the UN, because it was formed, we have all the data that we're gonna talk about soon. And all that data is a general, a, and on this, just the data itself, the collecting of the data, of, of awareness of what's happening across the planet. You realize when humans become aware of what's happening across the planet, and as a result of a mitzvah observance, we've brought out the best in humanity. So many wealthy, wealthy people who have enormous wealth start thinking about the poorer people and so on and so forth and how these people can be helped. Countries as countries get together and start thinking about improving the world's state of existence. When the UN was formed, it's the first time in history that nations have created a a, 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 an organization responsible for improving the lives of humanity across the world. In other words, nations will help nations. That is completely unheard of in history. Until this time, nations brutalized nations. If I was stronger, I took advantage of you. I grabbed your land, I grabbed your resources. Mankind was at each other's throats for thousands of years. And if you were defenseless against me, I had the power to take over your land. So that change in 1950, the Rebbe, the Rebbe connects it with the fact that, that it's the, it, and where did they establish it? New York. The Rebbe, the Rebbe connects it with the fact, the Rebbe says this openly, the fact that the previous Chabad Rebbe, and then continuation with the Rebbe himself, his city is New York. So therefore, since that's where the headquarters of operation of world transformation is coming from, that's why the UN building opens up right over there at that time. And it's, and what's it's written on, engraved on it, that nations will transfer, a Pasuk and Isaiah. In other words, they themselves are saying that they're here with a messianic dream. And what's their dream? It's a Pasuk in Yeshaya. And Yeshaya says that the nations of the world here, the Shafan says, this is what Melech HaMashiach himself is going to affect. V'shafat ben Goyim, he's going to um, judge amongst nations. V'yichiach la'amim, he's going to rebuke nations. Rabim. V'chitzu charvoisam le'itim, they will cut down their swords to plow shears, which means they will take weapons, and they will use these weapons instead of harming each other, they're going to use these weapons in order to assist other people. V'chani soi sehem, and their spears lemazmeirois, for pruning pruning um, um, tools which help help the, the vines grow and so on and so forth. So first of all, the idea that every nation, today's every nation, but every wealthy nation, is contributing money, it became normal, towards the improvement of poorer countries, to help distribute medicines to millions of people in Africa, to millions of children in Africa which are doomed to die. And people are improving that all these kids should get vaccinated. And millions of billions of dollars are being poured into organizations that are doing that work. The Rebbe at that time pointed to the United States going to, uh, where was it, Somalia? Somalia, and interfering in, in during this, the civil war that was going on over there, and actually making a food drop and coming in with their military. Now, even though that was only one story, see, but that's, that's what the tzaddik is, that's what the tzaddik, that's, the, that's what the visionary is. The visionary can pick up on a tiny little thing and see how that's the trend of humanity. Once it starts, there's no stopping it. It will continue and it will grow. So for a military, to use its military, its military equipment, its most sophisticated 
um, uh, helicopters. What were those? What were they called? The um, the Apache helicopters. I don't know if they had them then, but uh, things like this, which are used, which were designed and which were created for battle, to be used to go into hunger-stricken countries or countries that are in danger of war and so on, and to go in and help these countries. You also see that in the last couple of centuries, there are very little, this, 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 in the last, not centuries, in the last few decades, there's hardly any world aggression from country to country. And the reason is, we saw it by, when, I, when Iraq went and they attacked Kuwait, the world made a coalition to say, you can't do that. And the whole world clamped down on Iraq, and guess what? Since then, it didn't repeat itself again. No one attacked anybody. Do you realize that? Why? Because it's today known that if you're going to act aggressively, uh, Russia's been doing you know, a little bit in Ukraine and so on and so forth, because they're a little bit of, still of a bully. But in general, you don't see that anymore. Nations are afraid. Why? Because the world has formed a pact of peace, and you can't get away with. And instead, every time there's a crisis, take a look. Wherever there is a crisis, a natural disaster across the world, all the nations in the world, civilized nations, chip in by sending their militaries, sending their most, 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 most um, uh, um, uh, sophisticated equipment and sophisticated and people experts from across the world to help battle fires, to help battle other disasters. And Israel, of course, is at the top of that from the entire world when you see this, that we have the ability to help people in humanitarian crisis. So you see it's a change of attitude. That's the greatest thing. It's a change of attitude. People's minds and militaries, which were meant, again, as for aggressive purposes, for people to, to take from others, are becoming to help others. That's the greatest transformation humanity has ever seen. The Rebbe also pointed to this, that the greatest threat which was which uh, was to human life is nuclear nuclear um, um, nuclear arms and nuclear bombs and things like that, nuclear weapons, and the Rebbe then pointed to a meeting that happened in 1991 or 1992 January of 1991 1992 in New York, in which uh, Yeltsin and and President Bush and uh, some other lead, world leaders from France and from uh, England and others came together and there was made a nuclear pact in which there was a decision to decrease, to, to end the arm race and start decreasing our military, our, these, these, killing, these killing weapons, these mass killing weapons. And instead, it wasn't just that we're not going to do that because, you know, we have the resources. We're going to funnel those resources to improvement of life across the world help education, help, help our agriculture, and so on and so forth. So the Rebbe pointed that that, he said, is the work of Melech HaMoshiach himself. He pointed that that's why it's happening in New York. Again, that meeting was in New York. It's the effects of Moshiach. Now we're seeing that continuing. There's one rogue regime that's left over in the world in North Korea. And until last year, um, uh, they were literally flaunting their... Now you have Iran, and you have... North Korea basically and they were flaunting their their nuclear powers and so on and so forth and we've seen the tremendous progress that was made in the last year and of course the media doesn't want to talk about this because they don't want to give any credit to the one that they see as the biggest monster in all of history which is a discussion onto its own but the fact is that the fact that he came to the table and he negotiated and since then we haven't seen one ballistic missile fire so with all the chat that it's all baloney, we haven't seen one of them being fired and they're planning to have another meeting. So again, and even if it didn't happen yet, the fact that they're talking about it is already three quarters of the, of the, of the achievement. They just have to get it done. That means that the thinking patterns of people, of dictators, are changing. Are changing. That, that's huge. That's Moshiach. Now, let's go back to what the Rambam says. The Ramam says, Ba'is man in that time, So I watched this interesting video today. Ramam says, in the time of Mashiach, there won't be any hunger, there won't be any, any war. There won't be any jealousy. There will be so much good in the world. So it's interesting. I watched this little video where the guy says like this. Most people, 
the information that lays in their head is this information that they pay attention to, and that becomes their reality. So if you open up the news and you see shark attack off swimming for a swimmer in, I don't know, where in Northern California, and if you decide to go swimming that day in the ocean, you are terrified that you're going to be attacked with a shark. Because that's in your head, that's your reality. A shark. I remember I was in Florida once in Key West, and we went out with a boat. My family went out with a boat in Key West in Florida, beautiful water. And I never tried, forget about scuba diving, uh, snorkeling. So I went out to snorkel a little. And basically they dropped me in the water in a big, like, and it was like deep, it was a little vice, I'm swimming. I was so sure that I am gonna be taken down by a shark. I couldn't enjoy first, I couldn't even put my head down. I was, and, but I had to be brave, so I tried like for 15 minutes that a shark is gonna bite me. <laughs> a bite. I was terrified. Now, the chances for that to happen is basically, now, but I would get into the car, and I know my wife is always getting on my case, and if I'm a kind of agile, whatever it is, I, I'm sorry, no, don't tell anybody besides whoever's listening to this. It could happen that once in a while, if I'm, I'll take my phone and I need to just answer someone a short little text. The chances, God forbid, for something terrible to happen as a result of doing that is like so, 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 so much greater than what? Than being bitten by a shark. But that's not my reality because in the news I saw a shark attack and no one is busy talking about the thousands that lose their lives because they're texting while they're driving, right? So you see how the sensational news, whatever news puts at you, becomes your reality. So therefore for most people, if you talk about the condition of the world and you ask them where things are at, people think things are getting really bad. Things are getting really bad. And the news likes to paint that. The media likes to paint that because bad news sells and that's exciting. The truth, however, is there is a, I, I, I highly recommend everybody taking, writing this down. There is a, a, a website called ourworldindata.org. Ourworldindata.org. And this is basically a serious group of professors and people that actually took the time to look at the data that there is and create a, 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 a graphs, charts, about where the world is heading to. You read that website, you will be happy for weeks. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And you know Bill Gates and people like that who are actually thinking of improving the world. It's also amazing. It used to be when you were rich, you just took advantage of all the poor. The fact that rich people today have donated their time, their money. You know, the wealthiest people in the United States have dedicated most of their money to charity. That's crazy. To help people. That is unbelievable. I mean, they wanted to spend it for them, their grandchildren, we can never spend all the money they have. But still, the fact that they care and they want. So Bill Gates uses this website and uses it to be able to get the data and to be able to get the data and, and the knowledge of where the world is holding. Let's talk about life expectancy. Okay, so the crazy thing is what you see in all these things. If you watch the charts, you see for thousands of years, it, the chart is, is like basically the same, nothing changes. And from the 1800s, again, once Hasidus starts coming to the world and this new light starts coming to the world, and okay, obviously it, it brought, along with it, it brought, like I, I didn't mention, the Zohar says that in, 18, that in the beginning of 600 years to the life of Noah, the Zohar predicts, which the Zohar says is the 600th year to the 6th millennium which is around 1840, the, the gates of, 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 of wisdom will open from below and from above. So heavenly wisdom will come down from above and we discussed that. That's the knowledge of Torah, the esoteric knowledge, the knowledge of God. But the Zohar says, tremendous amount of wisdom and knowledge will come from the ground as well. And that's explained by the Mepharshim and the Zohar referring to uh, the increase of sciences and knowledge that will come. And the Zohar says that that's a preparation for the coming of Mashiach, to prepare the world to enter into the Messianic age. So the Zohar already predicted 2000, uh, uh, close to 2,000 years ago that about 150 years ago, mankind was gonna go into the age of enlightenment. And, and that's when you have the industrial revolution and so on and so forth. We're gonna see, soon see that all the amazing transformation that happens in the world, all the amazing transformation is basically built on the ability to people to be educated. 
Education is everything. Because we have education, then people, then the tyrants and the bullies don't have power. Because people are educated, and then the more educated they are, the more democracies start springing up. And once you have democracies, then you don't have the wars, the killings, you don't have the disadvantage that people, other people have, people who live in poverty and so on and so forth. It all changes with knowledge. And the Zohar says the knowledge will increase. And I, we mentioned earlier, we talk about knowledge spreading in 1990 is when we enter the information age because that's when we introduce the internet to the world and the ability to disperse knowledge, to, dis, not to, to, to spread knowledge across the world. 1990, exactly when it becomes Shabbos afternoon. So humanity gets its ultimate tool, which is knowledge. Now that knowledge obviously becomes knowledge of God, but even just first basic knowledge that people get and then empowers them, and therefore they can improve their lives and improve others. Okay, so let's start with life expectancy. Okay, so here we got a chart, which I'm just going to read a few statistics. You didn't have any data back then. So the only place they can get some data in 1543, okay, so we're talking about, about 500 years ago, a little less. A child being born in England, okay, so England is already a little bit more, it's not India, it's not, it's a totally backward country, it's a little more of a, so in, 19, in, in 1543, the child expectation, average child can expect to live 33 years. That's life expectancy in 1543. 300 years later, close to 300 years later, in France in 1819, not much change, 37 years old. A baby, see, so many babies are not gonna make it past five years old because the child mortality rate is unbelievable. So many children are dying not even making it through it from tuberculosis, from other kinds of diseases, from things that children just didn't make it, illnesses that happened, okay? Now let's go to the 1900. So again, from, from in the UK and in France, 33, 37, till the 1900s. 1900, talking about only about 120 years ago. In the US in 1900, and let's just take a look at, 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 at the rise from 1900. In the US, a person's average lifespan, 49 years, you can expect to live. Now let's understand something. These graphs are very important. They're if you're born that year and then things didn't change with the current sta state of affairs continuing. So if a child is born in 1900 and the world stays the way it is 1900 and we don't have any new innovations of medicine and so forth. So in 1900 when a child was born, the prediction of life for a child in the United States was to live to 40 years old. 49, I'm sorry, to 50. In Russia, it was still 30 years old. 30, and in England, it was 33 in 1543. In Russia, it's still 30 in the 1900s, okay? In India, the life expectancy of a child in 1900 is 23. Person can expect to live to 23 if they're lucky. Okay, no, that's, I would say, average. In Australia, 57, so they're, pretty much ahead. In 1950, that's why we have you for here from Australia. In 1950, 10 years later, it jumps. You see how the jump is like, basically every year since 19, uh, no, 1950 is 50 years, but in 50 years difference, you have an average US citizen being born in 1950, he can expect to live to 68 years old. In Russia, 55, tremendous improvement. In India, from 23 to 35, and in Australia, you're already up from 57 to 68. In 1990, the US average person being born in 1990 can expect to live to 75. Again, this if conditions don't change they are, as they are in 1990. In Russia, 68. In India, 57. So we're dealing with more than double from what was 90 years before. It means a child, when you're giving birth to a child, you can expect this child to live twice as long as he was. In Australia, 76. Okay, in 2015, child being born. In the US, 79, about 80 years old. Russia, 70, from just, uh, you know, uh, th uh, 30, 50. India, 68. So you're talking about what, what's beautiful over here is you're gonna see that these changes don't only happen in what we call the rich countries. These changes are happening globally which means transformations are happening across the world. In Australia, 82. Now that's 2015. 
and I'm talking about 2018, 2019, the statistics are probably higher. And again, if you consider all the improvements that are being made every time in medicine and so on and so forth, we're soon gonna see that it's possible that maybe not, I mean, we, I mean, without, I mean, Mashiach is coming. I'm saying, the, just in the messianic experience that's happening, it's possible that a child being born today can technically have the ability to live forever. And I'm gonna show you why in a few moments. So you're talking about eradication of all disease out of all sickness and people actually living forever, but hold it. Um, in, let's talk about children dying. In 1990, Twelve point six million children died across the world. In 2017, it went down by half. More than half. 5.4 million children. Do you realize the tremendous this isn't talking about in how many years? We're talking about uh, 1990, 25 years. Drop. Less than half or more than half that are less deaths for children. How about, so that's what we're talking about life expectancy. How about world poverty? Watch this graph. In 1820, it would be nice if I can actually show this. That's why we have to do this as a, as a PowerPoint. Ezra Sashem will develop it. So you're just getting the first presentation on this. In 1820, 94% of the human population lived in what the UN would call extreme poverty. So let's do this again. Let's hear the statistics. In 1820, 94% of the human population lived in extreme poverty. And that has been since when? It didn't start in 1820. That is from when we, the, the longest uh, we've keep, kept records on human life. So till 1820, 94% of humans lived in extreme poverty. In 1870, it went down a little bit. So you're talking about 50 years later. 90% are still living in poverty. In 1900, 85%. Okay, so this change from 94, 10% less. That's already improvement. That's all you, you see all the changes happening from the 1800s, corresponding to what we had spoken about, the increase of knowledge, the increase of, right? 1950, you're down to 72% of world population living in extreme property. poverty. I mean, in 1980, we're down to 44%. We cut it in half. And in 1990, 37% is still living in, in, in poverty. Where is it holding by from 2015 and onward? That's the last statistics they gave us from 2015. Less than 10% of the world population lives in poverty. So from 1820 or even um, 1870, you, you, you're talking about from 90% of people that are living in poverty you're down to less than 10%. And therefore, this whole idea that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer is baloney. It's lies. It's not true. Actually, human, this is what they say. There's a quote from that, from that website. Again, this is our world and data. Since 1988, the world has changed dramatically and it's becoming more equal. What does the Rambam say? There won't be kinna v'tacharis. There won't be so much jealousy. Why? There will be so much good. So if you're looking literally at the data, you're seeing that in the last 20 years, talking about, it's like we sit in Kvetch, we're saying, oh, the Rebbe said Mashiach is coming 25 years ago, and what's going on? Take a look, from 37%, we're down to less than 10% of people in the world living in poverty. This is what I, I wrote down from literally from the website. Um, so we should not be complacent, but the world is heading in the right direction. Three things, incomes are growing in all parts of the world. Global poverty is declining rapidly. The poorest countries are growing the fastest across the world. That's unbelievable. That's, 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 
But you know, and here's the crazy thing. So you're talking about what? That, 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 that there's no, the poverty is declining. And they're talking already about by which year they can wipe out poverty completely from the world. Okay. The fact that people want to do this, that's even the bigger Chiddush. That humans are thinking, you're living in your Beverly Hills mansion or in Malibu, you have everything, you have, you're so rich, but it bothers you that other people are hungry. This is the change. This is the transformation that we, the Jewish people, did. You see, the science is providing the means and the ability to be able to... But the psychology, the change of people thinking that we should care about people's lives and so on, this is holiness, this is godliness. This is the spark of Hashem that Hashem put into every human being that's coming out. God cares for His creation. You care because you have a spark of God in you that cares about it. And that's why people are caring about other people across the world. Um, but here's the amazing thing. This tremendous decline in, in poverty is at the same time that the world population skyrocketed. So you're talking about, you know what I'm saying? In 1800, in 1800, 200 years ago about, there were less than a billion people in the planet. And yet 90% of them were starving. Or in extreme poverty. Less than a billion people in the world. What happened? Today there's over 7 billion, close to 8 billion, between 7 and 8 billion people. So from 1900 to the year 2000, population growth went three times more than the entire population growth from the beginning of time until, until that, that period. See what's going on? From the beginning of time until 1900, you had a growth of population, world population, and from 1900, 100 years, the world made three times as more people and, than, than ever before. I think God wants people in the world. He wants people to be able to receive His abundant goodness, and at the same time, the resources that, have now been, that, are, that are now being developed are becoming, are becoming so vast and so norm, uh, enormous that it's enough to feed all these people and to take care of all these people and they're living way better than people live. But it's, it's also the quality of life. You go through charts and charts. I, mean, I was watching some of it last night. I, I, I couldn't write down all of it. It's, it's just amazing. The average worker, working person, I don't know if you mean, I don't remember if he said only the United States or I think in the United States. But the average working person in the United States is living today in far greater comfort and in far greater, um, with more at, available to them, way more available to them, than kings, than monarchs lived 300 years ago, 200 years ago. The access to any kind of food, the access to, to relaxation, the access to things that you have that the people didn't have then. It's unbelievable. It's really, really unbelievable. Let's talk about violence. Talk about, people talk about guns, mass shootings. Oy, gewalt, this country, wow, knows. <laughs> it's not true. It's on the decline. The FBI says in the last generation, 50%, the, it dropped, the, the um, people being killed by a gun or by a 50% drop. But let's take a look in general. 1,300 in England, I think, I, 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 I think I'm explaining this correctly. I will, as I told you, I feel like this research that I did was kind of just recent, and I, I, I really should um, get more perfect uh, to understand these graphs better, but this is my understanding of this particular graph and chart that they had. The world is so, was such a violent place for, hundreds, for thousands of years that in the 1300s, England, if you lived in England, you had a 20% chance being killed by another human being. 
Okay, that's, that's, that's in addition to, <laughs> to what we spoke about being dying from illness and hunger and all that kind of stuff. But we're talking about killed by another person, 20% of the population would die through an act of violence. In Germany, okay, the Germans, 35%. In the Netherlands, it was also 35. In Italy, 55. No, was said to the to, to Esav, right? 55%. And actually, a few years after that, in in I think in uh, by the time we're talking about 1500s, in Italy it rose. It went up to about 70%. People were just killing each other. In 1600, in England, look how much it dropped. It went why? Here's understand something. Once you have printing press. And once you have literacy, and people are educated, education brings a tremendous drop in violence. That's what happens. So in 1600s, England, 5%. That's a drop from 20%. In Germany, 10%. In Netherlands, 5%. Italy, still 30%. This, is only in, this graph is only, from, is only from Europe. Now, that we're dealing with places that are, at least were civilized countries, places that didn't have really a, a normal government. You're talking about much, much, much higher numbers. In 1800s, England down to 2%. In Netherlands, 2%. Germany, 3%. Italy, 18%. 2010, in all these countries, it's way less than 1%. I, don't, I, I can't see because it shows the zero and the, the graph is going to the zero. You see it going like this. And you're talking about against all of the history of mankind. So I want to share with you something. The Alter Rebbe says, Rabbi Mishneh Zalman of Liadi says, that by Aseris Adibris, when Hashem says to the Jewish people, Lo Tirzach, thou shalt not commit murder, don't kill. He says it means two things. It's a commandment you shouldn't kill but it's also a promise. Loy Tirzach, you will not kill. Three and a half thousand years ago, God is speaking at Har Sinai, telling the Jewish people that humanity will not murder. And now, violence, this is what they write, violence has been in decline in, in, uh, 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 over long stretches of time. Harvard professor Stephen, uh, I think is Pink, I wrote it, Pinkus, I think. And we, may, and we may be living in the most peaceful time in our species, species existence. In terms of wars, I have here, in 1900, 10% of the world population, oh, no, this is, in 1900, 10% of the world population lived in democratic countries. 10% in 1900. Now more than 50%. This was annual worldwide battle deaths. In 1950, 21% of people. In 1950. In 2010, less than a percent. So you're seeing tremendous in every aspect. Loy rov, loy molchama. There's still problems, you know, certain places. But it's nothing. If you take the data and you take, and you take a look at the world, you see, it's an unbelievable, unbelievable improvement in every aspect of life. So if I shared with you over here a little video, I'm not gonna, I don't have how to show it to you, but I'm just gonna. We truly are living in an extraordinary time. Ladies and gentlemen, what gives me tremendous confidence in the future is the fact that we are now more empowered as individuals to take on the grand challenges of this planet. We are living into an extraordinary decades ahead. Thank you. All right, so talk about, um, talk about Chayim Nitzchiyim. They're saying over here, let me show you over here, that it, they shouldn't have already a drug or certain um, abilities in 2018. This is talking already a few years before that. In 2018, there should be um, certain medical um, or, 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 or some kind of a that can make your cells stay younger for a long, much, much, much long periods of time. So which means people can then live to much, much longer time. But then they say like this, by 2050, they have, hold on, let me expand this. 
Yeah, hold on. By 2050. Self, oops. Oh, here's it. There we are. Self replicating nanobots could be ready to put into our bodies that repair damaged cells and fight diseases, potentially making us immortal. How far are we from 2020, 2050? That's again. We're talking about so the concept that it says when Mashiach will come, people will live forever. It's no more a, it's no more a crazy dream. Talk about Tchias Amesim. They're talking about resurrecting the um, Tanzmedia um, different animals, which they believe they can soon bring back. So we talk these these these. Oh, but let me share with you some other really cool things. In and the Navu over here, it says, also in Yeshaya, hold on, where is it? Oz tipakachna ene ivrin. Then the eyes of the blind, Oz tipakachna, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Vaozne chershim, and the ears of the deaf. Tipatachno will open up. Oz yedale kayol piseach. A limping person will leap like a, like a wild deer. Well, I, again, on this same video that I'm. Today they have surgical procedures done by a robot in which they literally took someone that's practically blind. You can watch the video of the person going into the hospital, you can't see. And then they go into the back of the retina and they, they remove something that's blocking. And suddenly, they, they en enables the tear to close. And it's only with a robot that can make such a delicate surgery. And then you see the person being faced with something. He's looking at his clock and he says, I can see. 22 minutes after nine, you see, unbelievable. Uh, and then another person, you can watch it with your own in other words, technology is coming to a place where soon blind people will not be blind anymore. I mean, again, I don't know if it applies to every type of blindness yet, but we're on a road to fulfillment of this prophecy, and the same is also with hearing aids to people. I don't know if you got to see that little baby a few, a few, a few weeks ago. There was this video that was circulating of a little baby that had an infection as soon as they were born, a stomach infection. And because of that, they had to take certain antibiotics which literally killed their, the baby's hearing. And the baby never, was never able to hear. And then they did some kind of a, of a in our procedure, I think they gave him some kind of a hearing aid in, inside or something like that. And you watch, it's the cutest video you've seen. This little baby, oh, six months, seven months old, um, suddenly her sister, her sister, or maybe a year old, uh, comes comes to her and the baby starts laughing. You see, the, you see the joy of this little child who can hear for the first time. And I was saying that that's what it says when Mashiach will come. We will all laugh because we will start being able to hear godliness. But these are prophecies being fulfilled. It says today's days they have synth synthetic. I think I don't know if it's called synth synthetic. What do they call it? Row feet. People that have had amputations, they can create legs made out of plastic metal and so on and so forth to the point that the person the people that are walking it's demonstrated are walking and there isn't even the slightest indication that they're limping or something there's nothing and some of them have two such feet it they can walk they can run they can run upstairs it senses it, it has no idea what it's doing because it's 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 an inanimate object but it senses the body's desire or whatever the, the movement that the body can pick up and they create it in a way that people who don't have their legs can actually run and leap and like a regular, if you're wearing long pants, you have zero idea that this person is missing both their legs from their knee down. This is the pure nevuas of, of Mashiach. So what I want to just conclude, I'm going to conclude the whole thing, is that this, all of this is coming simultaneously 
along with this tremendous change that you see in the world, as I showed you. You look at most of those graphs, you see it being almost at the same time, till about 18, 1850, that it starts going up, and you see it going up like this. If you compare it to all of history, you see it going up in the shortest period of time to enormous, the decrease of wars. So the interesting thing is that from about the 1800s, 1700s, the Jewish people start going back to the land of Israel. Now as we finished our tikkun, we go into the world, we do our tikkun, we're done, Jews start coming back to the land of Israel because that's where we belong. And in the 1900s, when it's, when it's getting even stronger, and stronger, more Yidin are coming back to the land of Israel. And in 1990, more of us, because we finished already that, that whole idea of fixing the world. And Israel is, in terms of this whole graph, in terms of its productivity and its growth, is like beyond, beyond what, what you're seeing anywhere else. And you see clearly that this is all evolving the Jewish people. And it's going to be in one of the greatest, most beautiful moments are going to be when all of humanity will recognize the source of who brought all this change. That it's really a result of the Torah and the mitzvahs and that, that has brought this. Because again, all the changes come to the world as a result of education. We were always people of education. I'm talking about, forget about the mystical stuff. The mystical idea that we remove the blockages is one thing. The mere idea that we were into sharing knowledge, into writing books, into teaching, and so on and so forth, which has changed the course of humanity. So this is definitely an indication. After such a class, I don't even think I can call it first fruits. It's like a whole crop that we're already seeing that is already here. And all we need now is for Mashiach to stand up and say hello to everyone. May we see that now.